So Mary, the lead statistician, our uh, SWOC chair is, is at OHSU in, down in Portland, Chuck Blanke. The uh, chair of the Lung Committee, David Gandera, is at UC Davis. And um, so on, Vali, I'm not going to butcher her last name. She's the study chair at uh, MD Anderson. And then, of course, NCI, NIH, Foundation of the NIH, and all that there in, uh, in DC. In terms of the study team here at the SWOG Stat Center, which is co-located um, between CRAB and the Hutch, here's, here are all the names. The uh, names on the left, they're all statisticians, with Mary the lead, Mike LeBlanc, the director of the SWOG Stat Center, and uh, a list of statisticians. I'm not going to read down all the names. And the people on the right, they're here at, the, at CRAB. They're data managers and uh, programmers, uh, application developers. So huge effort by a huge team and project managers and all that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very unique private-public partnership, very complex. With, um, so SWOG is one of the five cooperative groups, right? The other ones are inside the circle there. And, um, collaboration with Friends of Cancer Research and Foundation of NIH. And with it come all the challenges you can imagine, NCI, FDA. And uh, here's the DC setting. So it's uh, originally stage four non-small cell lung cancer with squamous histology. It's about 25% of non-small cell lung cancer patients. And originally it was uh, for patients who failed one frontline uh, treatment. And uh, that patient population, they have a median progression-free survival of about three months and a median overall survival of well, eight months. So pretty dismal disease setting. And at the time when we designed the study and opened the study, the only approved therapy for those patients was doxotaxel. Um, the motivation for lung map, which is a, um, a map we call a master protocol or an umbrella design, is for those patients to have a pipeline open to test different drugs, to have them um, screened genetically, to uh, encourage more trial participation, and really to have a, uh, a much faster timeline for, for drug biomarker testing and to um, a much faster turnaround for approval for effective and safe um, regimens. And this was the original design of the study. So a patient, we would take tissue from a patient, the biomarker would be profiled, and then depending on what biomarker the, the patient tested positive for, they'd be enrolled, they'd be assigned to those sub-studies. Or if they didn't test positive for a biomarker, they'd be assigned to the uh, non-match study. And the original design looked like this. This is when we opened it in June 2014. There was four sub-studies, four biomarker-driven sub-studies, and one non-match sub-study. And so a patient, you know, they get, their, they get their, um, their tissue submitted, and if they test positive for a sub-study, they're enrolled in one of those four arms. And if they don't, they get enrolled in a, a non-match sub-study. Now, if a patient tested positive for two or three markers, then they were randomly assigned to one of those sub-studies, dependent on the, um, on the prevalence of the biomarker in such that the, the um, more rare biomarker would get, would be, I mean, it would be a preferential assignment to that sub-study. So as you see, um, they're all randomized at the, um, randomized phase two, three trial designs, and I'll show you the slide for that later. But everybody in here gets assigned to biomarker. Most of them are biomarker versus doxotaxel, except for the fourth one over. So this was the original study design for each subarm. Patients got assigned to their um, to the trial and randomized to, a fa to the phase two portion of the study. And then the um, end of phase two was really the no-go, go-no-go decision of whether or not to go into phase three. So that's, and that decision 
is, is like an interim analysis, but just for fertility, right? You only, you only stop for negative results. And what's different from, a, when, from a, um, an interim analysis that you would do in a phase three study is that the hazard ratio was very aggressive of 0.4 or 0.5, and the, the uh, error rates are larger. You take phase two error rates of about 10%, so 90% power alpha of 10% to decide whether or not to go on. And then if you pass that, um, that interim analysis, you go on to the phase three portion, and that was done um, without temporarily halting the study, so just like you would do an interim analysis. So a really nice, efficient way to get to drug approval. Now, um, some of the challenges, right, between launch of study and activation, I showed you that slide, there's many cooks, right, and that's, that's the biggest um, the biggest challenge for such a study. So we had to select the platform platform for the biomarker testing, the drugs and the biomarkers for the first set of studies, and then the negotiations with the NCI, with the FDA, and with five drug companies, right? You had to get your design through. Mary, I'm sure, can tell you stories about stories about that. Then the budgeting and the contracting with five drug companies. And, uh, and then the implementation into our system, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Is, it, was just, it was just challenging on, um, on all ends. So it was really impressive how this could be pulled off in just a little over a year. So I'll switch gears and I'll talk about the system's requirements for a study like that. And I'll start out with um, what we typically have in our SWOC database. We have um, functionalities and permissions for different user groups. And this user group here, this is the sites, the one on the right with the bar. So, so the sites, the, the data managers, the, the CRAs entering the data, they have their own workbench, there's a way to track the specimen, they have a way to review the charts, there's a way to, to send images with, uh, electronically with AG MedNet, there is an emergency unblinding for blinded studies. So these are for, for the sites that are used to running SWOC studies. They, they love those functionalities. They're dear to their hearts. So we've got to make sure we have those available for them. Um, in terms of data coordinators here at CRAB, so those are the, pe the people who review the data that goes into the database, we also have a variety of functionalities and um, for, for them they have an evaluation system, chart manager, uh, also again they're used to lo looking at those, um, at those functionalities. And then for us statisticians here on the left, we have some cool things too. Uh, most notably, the SRW, our Statistical Research Workbench, which is um, a combination between Word and SAS, where we can, that, that's already all pre-programmed. In all of our studies, we run reports every six months, and we can look at our studies and um, have up-to-date data as, as by the minute we run the we just hit an update button and all the tables and graphs that are in there uh, show up. So we have some pretty neat systems in our SWOC database that we want to maintain for this, SWOC, for this lung map trial. Um, here. So traditionally what happens for a SWOC study, oops, too many cables. Um, this is for a traditional SWOC study, the, the workflow. It starts with the site there on the top left that enters a patient into what's called OPEN, which is a registration system that's um, imposed upon us by the NCI. So all the cooperative groups have to use that. We have our, our randomization tool is a, within SWOG, and then um, the EDC and is a, uh, is in Metadata Rave and it's in um, saved in Houston. So this is what the sites enter. And then because we have this cool functionality that I just showed you, we actually copy all the data over into our SWOG data 
base, which is Oracle. So the, the you know the, what's st st stored in Houston is metadata rave. Our database is Oracle, and it's just functionalities that had been um, had been built over so many decades that we didn't want to part part with all the other cooperative groups. They just have their data in Houston at metadata rave. So what's different and what's more complicated with the lung map study is, so it's a collection, right? Each, each one of these uh, studies below is like a traditional SWOG study, but it's this umbrella portion of the design that makes it more complicated. So patients first uh, submit, their, or submit their specimen and it needs to go to do a biomarker analysis to decide which substudy they're being assigned to. And there's a whole host of new challenges associated with that. And this is what it looks like for this lung map study. So the top half, that's, that's what I just showed you of the graph. That's what I showed you what happens for every um, SWOG study. And then the extra complication, that's on the bottom half. Where on the very bottom right, that's where the site enters, I mean, enters the specimen or puts the specimen into a specimen tracking and enters some information into the into the form and uh, that specimen is then sent to foundation medicine which then determines whether or not the patient tests positive for a biomarker and if so for which one they then enter that information into the SWOC database and um, then the, then the patient's assigned to one of the sub-studies and that happens and then they go into that upper portion of them, um, of this graph. So this just summarizes the software re requirements. Patient registration done in open, electronic data capture in RAVE, biomarker analysis by Foundation Medicine, specimen tracking by uh, using one of our SWOG applications, and then all the reporting tools and everything within SWOG. And uh, so we have five different organizations and 11 different components. So what I mean by components, there are all these. If you count them up, there's 11 of them. Um, so the initial trial, right, we had five, six trials, almost 200 ECRFs. They all had to open the same day. They all had the same activation date, very aggressive timelines. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's, what's the next bullet point of frequent changes. So the study already has quite a bit of history. And then we, we want it all integrated in the, into that SWOG database that I showed you initially with all the 900 other studies so we can use all of our cool tools that we're all used to. So there's about 50 different applications that, that go into that database. So lung map history, right, a study is only a year and a half old and there's already a long, long history. So um, to remind you, the study opened in June 2014. In November, Amgen came out with those news that uh, they would be terminating all Amgen-sponsored clinical trials of rilatumumab. And if you look at our original lung map trial, one of the sub-studies had rilatumumab as one of the agents. So um, going back, see the news came out November 24th. On November 26th, we closed that study. I mean, you can imagine how, what the scrambling that was going on here at the STAT Center and the calls and the craziness. So then we were, set, we were left with three sub-studies, four biomarker-driven sub-studies and one non-match sub-study. A few months later, the next news hit, um, BMS, they now have an, a new agent, nivolumab, got approved for the treatment of patients with previously treated metastatic squamous cell non-small cell lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the patient population that for decades there was do doxotaxel, that was it, right? And if you... This, this was the results, I mean, striking, beautifully positive, right? It's the, the, a dream come true if you want to, for a, a, any trial. This is overall survival of um, doxa, do, doxataxel in the control arm and nivolumab in the um, experimental arm. Hazard ratio of, where did I see it? 
Thank you, 0.59, yes. So if you look at our, tr uh, let me go back to where we were, see all the, all the control arms in all these stu studies are doxotaxel, right? So f what we did, first we closed the control arm for the non-match patients because clearly there the new therapy is no longer, standard of care is no longer doxotaxel. And uh, we just assigned them to the NTPDL1. The other, the other sub-studies we left alone until a little later in the year when we completely redesigned the study, when I say we, Mary, right? Completely redid the study. And now rather than just having a seamless phase two, three design, most of the arms are now, except for the non-match study, are actually um, seamless single arm phase two, phase three trials. And this is shown right here. So the non-match study changed again, this time to nivolumab, the new, sta new standard of care, plus or minus their um, PDL1 in agent. And then the biomarker driven ones, they're now single stage, phase two designs, very simple, 40 patients, overall response as the primary endpoint. And then if you, know, if you pass all the thresholds, then you go on to a phase three randomized study. And in this case, we didn't even bother specifying the control arm because if once they hit that stage, who knows what the control arm will be, right? So we left that open. The control arm now is TBD. In the single um, arm phase two trial is, is, um, is shown right here. So overall response rate, if it's high enough, um, you go on to the, to the um, phase three trial. There's also a way to get accelerated approval at the FDA if you have really high response rates. And there's another way that I read the, um, last night in your stats section, Mary, there's a way to, to for progressions for survival if that's extra good, even if the response rate's not so great, you can go on. So this is um, where we're at not quite now, so all the blue ones are the ones that are open, and the green ones, those are the next ones, so there's more changes coming. So we have the three um, biomarker-driven sub-studies here on the left. We have a fourth one that's going to be open later this year, and then for the non-match, we'll only um, randomize checkpoint-naive patients to uh, nivolumab plus or minus ipulumumab, and we'll have a single arm trial, I mean, a, 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 another uh, trial for the checkpoint refractory agents. I'm sorry, patients. And uh, this is where we're at right now. We have 429 active institutions, 216 IRBs, uh, 638, that was as, as of last Friday, 638 specimens submitted. So those are patients who are registered to um, the, the umbrella portion of the trial, and 226 have been accrued to the sub-studies.